Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? OK. So, oops. I should have turned my <laughs> notifications off. OK, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about a project that I worked on um, called Thriving in the Macondo, where I worked with a group of refugees in the Macondo refugee community, which is just on the outskirts of Vienna and Simmering. Uh, before I head into that, I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about myself. But this is also a participatory session, so I'd like for you to have your phones out, ready to go. Um, I'll be doing a little bit of um, passing these around uh, later. And uh, in a second, there's going to be a Twitter activity. So <laughs> all right. So who am I? Uh, again, my name is Josephine Dorado. Um, a lot of my background actually comes from theater and dance. So I thought it would be kind of fun to show a dance shot from 20 years ago. Um, a lot of the thought that uh, what, uh, what I do in digital media and sort of immersive virtual space has to do with the way that the body is translated into online space. So, wow, really, with these, like I never get these, these menu notifications. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so what was a very formative part of that was doing a Fulbright scholarship, which enabled me to go from New York to Amsterdam and live there for a year and to be able to really deeply research interactive technology and performance and the ways that you can extend the body and performance in digital space. So one of the things that I realized, and this was way back in 2003, before Skype, before live stream, before any of those platforms um, existed, um, I did a networked performance, uh, basically, in this case, defining network performance as a performance with performers in different geographical spaces. So we had dancers in Amsterdam and a band in New York and a video artist in Helsinki, and we all streamed our materials together, and I rebroadcast it online. And again, at the time, there weren't any ready-made platforms like Livestream or Skype. So you know, it was about setting up your own QuickTime streaming server and broadcasting it that way. So here was the group in Amsterdam with um, us and some of the media artists, the dancers. And then on that, sort of like the area on the floor that looks like eggshells, it is eggshells. And um, the video is being streamed into, onto, that, onto, the, onto that eggshell area from Helsinki. On the other side, in New York, this was the band doing voiceovers and materials and things like this. Oh, nice. OK, so, um, so depending on where you were, you were seeing different kinds of a different sort of performance. So here in New York, you were watching the band. And you can see on the right, picture on the right, they're watching us through the live stream and the dancers in Amsterdam. So that was a really early experiment from which I experimented many more times with network performance. And then the idea for cultural exchange through technology and performance came about. So this was actually another performance in 2005 where, here we go, um, I took dancers in Texas and in Florida and musicians in LA and New York and mixed together their uh, streams and manipulated the streams and rebroadcast it. So, and again, at the time, there weren't sort of ready-made platforms. So I took the streams into Max MSP and used IRC chat to communicate with my performers. I'm going, I'm dating myself here. If any of you remember IRC or still use it, old school. Um, OK, so th these were the streams in Max MSP. So basically, the dancers were improvising together. And we used improvisational frameworks similar to jazz, except for movement and music mixed together. And you can see the mixed together stream here. Um, uh, different sorts of things were affecting the hint and the, two, the hue and the tint of the image, meaning that if they were to move with more intensity and speed, that kind of thing, it actually affected the color of the filter, that kind of thing. So there were a lot of experimenting with what we can affect in somebody else's shared virtual space. So these were some shots from the performance that we did online of the improvisers, the dancers improvising together, and the musicians were improvising together too. Okay. So flash forward uh, a few years, uh, I was so very influenced by my time with Fulbright and doing cultural exchange, but also in a, being able to work together online and creatively collaborating online, that after I was finished with my Fulbright, I created a nonprofit program called Kids Connect that connected students in different countries through creative collaboration and theatrical performance inside virtual 3D worlds. So 
basically what we did in, this is a shot of the pilot program that we did where students in New York and Amsterdam got together inside the 3D virtual world Second Life. Uh, this was back in 2005. And we had them create a 3D hybrid city together that had aspects of both of their countries. So you had little Dutch houses next to big skyscrapers and also live streamed the video from the physical space into the virtual space. So you got sort of a window into each other's world where you could see the actual physical space, but then they had a shared virtual space where they could create things together. And once they built that hybrid virtual city, we asked them to make a story and then perform the story online in their new hybrid virtual city. So they're learning about each other's culture while they're having fun and they're not even realizing that they're learning about each other's culture. So um, another thing that I do is I do occasional consulting with the State Department through their tech camps. And tech camps is an initiative, originally an initiative of Hillary Clinton's, to bolster the digital capacities of NGOs worldwide through, um, especially in conflict zones and developing countries, things like that. So I've been to places like um, Ukraine before, during, and after the revolution, Algeria, Tunisia, I worked with Libyans and in Palestine, things like that. So really getting to know the people there, understanding what their challenges are, and then building digital solutions around them. So this was a tech camp that we did, an output from the tech camp that we did in um, Algeria. And basically, I used the DIY mobile storytelling platform, Seven Scenes. And you can add story elements onto a map. And the story elements can be text, video, audio. And then you can create sort of a, a mobile storytelling game or scavenger hunt from that. Um, they decided they wanted to focus on driving safety because I didn't know this, but Algeria has the third highest rate of uh, car fatalities. So they called the app iDrive Safe, and instead of making sort of a game of it, they just wanted to make points that were danger points. And the danger points uh, were at the danger points, if you approached it within, let's say, 200 meters, a story would pop up about what happened there and why it's a danger point. So <clears throat> really easy platform to work with and sort of an example of the things that we would do in a tech camp. So my question to you is, in Twitter, Using the hashtag WTMVIE17, uh, Women Tech Makers Vienna hashtag, and go ahead and tag me at FunkSoup if you do use Twitter. And uh, tag me and just say hello and introduce yourself. So we all have kind of a running little roster of who's in the session, and um, we can sort of virtually meet each other that way. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yourself. Just say hello. Hashtag WTMVIE17 at FunkSoup. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, keep talking, but you can please go ahead and introduce yourselves on Twitter. And I'll talk a little bit about Macondo. So Macondo is a refugee settlement that goes back many years. Again, it lies on the outskirts of Vienna and Simmering, and it's been home to successive waves of refugees since 1956. The name Macondo, that's not actually the name of the community, technically. The, t the technical name is like some long governmental name, but everybody knows it as Macondo, though technically that's not it. And it was named by the settlers there for from Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novel, 100 Years of Stalin. Solitude, which is a tiny settlement that didn't really have any connection to the outside world, but it grew to be eventually become a large and thriving place, like Macondo has itself. So this is, these are a couple of shots from the community. And this is what some of the apartment buildings look like. And just to zoom in on the kinds of diversity that's in Macondo. What I really love about it is that it just is a microcosm of the world. So in 1956, Hungarians arrived en masse, and then 1968, Czech and Romanians arrived, and then in the 1970s, you had the Vietnamese boat people arriving. Um, and Chileans fle fleeing from Pinochet. And then today, you have big waves of Somalians, Afghanistans, Pakistans, uh, Chechnyans, and Syrians, so, and, and more. So it's really this wonderful little microcosm there. It's kind of neat seeing the <laughs> tweets come up. Hello. OK. So, <clears throat> So I wanted to talk about a bit of presence and identity. And I actually worked with this particular refugee community in 2009, 2009. Um, so I've worked, I worked with them about seven years ago. And 
it was an offshoot of the Kids Connect project that I called Macondo Dance Connect, which was basically a way to use dance and virtual 3D space to have the kids, and I worked with the kids there, have the kids reconnect to their original cultures. So we asked them to create a dance for their avatars, mapping movement onto their avatars that re reminded them of, of their original cultures. And then we also made a dance in real life space, the physical space. Uh, one of the things that we did was explored digital storytelling. So this is the bus stop, like the one bus stop that comes in and out of Macondo. And then they also had a little digital version. Each kid has a digital version of their bus stop. And they could paste their own pictures and their own story into that. And when you clicked on that, you heard an audio narrative of where they came from and how they got to Macondo. So it was a way of representing themselves. But I think what's really important, too, if you're going to use a any kind of technology is not to be technocentric about it. Like, why are you using it, right? There, I feel like very deeply that even though I work with technology all the time, like there needs to be like a really um, essential need for it. And and if you're going to use it, to really leverage the affordances of it. So one thing that's really nice about virtual th 3D world space, especially Second Life, uh, which definitely had its heyday in the early 2000s, but I still think it's a really great platform for exploring identity. Because what you can do with your avatar is you can make your avatar whatever shape, color, size you want. It doesn't have to be a prefabricated avatar. So we experimented with identity using avatar role playing. And in this one, we asked, the activity was they had to make two avatars. The first avatar had to look like themselves. And the next avatar had to look nothing like themselves. So they had to be a different color, a different body shape, different hair, tall, short, different gender even. And then they had to be that other avatar for a whole session. Okay? And then we sort of had a discussion around what, how it affected them, like what kinds of interactions they had as this other avatar. Because believe it or not, that kind of interaction embodying an other avatar that looks very different from you really sticks with them, right? So they carry that into their real life. And we talked about like what it felt like to have a different skin color, to be taller, shorter, fatter, skinnier, that kind of thing. Um, so avatar role playing is a big part of the Kids Connect program. This is a screenshot from their final performance at Macondo Dance Connect. And again, they're live streaming their dance in the video screens. And then the avatars are also doing a dance in the virtual space. And they built that space together, too. OK, so I'm going to go to this one. So I just have to do a hat tip, because this particular project with uh, refugees this past spring was supported by Fulbright Austria and the museum's courtier. I was able to be a Fulbright museum's courtier artist in residence for a springtime. And then some more shots of the community here, the apartment buildings, um, and then the playground in front. And then this is interesting, because this used to be, when I was here, uh, seven years ago, this used to be the integration center where they held languages, language classes. They still have language classes, but they've moved it into a different classroom. And this whole yellow building is now a detention center. Okay, so that's actually very different from what it was before. So it's like a holding place now. Okay, so one thing that I discovered is that in order to be closer to the refugee community, I wanted to build a level of trust. Um, one, uh, one thing that I discussed with the director, basically it's kind of a hot topic right now, refugees. So there are a lot of people coming in, journalists, artists, that want to work with the refugee community. And um, they're, they feel a little bit exploited sometimes. So I wanted to be able to get to know them, to understand what they needed, what I could give back to them, what would be like a really mutual relationship, not just I'm going to interview you and, oh, here's my coffee table book. Like, what, like you know, like that's not going to do them any good. You know, so a lot of that was just being in the community and understanding uh, the dynamics of how it worked. And one thing that I really love to do is I also teach aerial Pilates and aerial fitness. I use this aerial hammock like that, that you can suspend basically from anywhere that's really stable. So I found a beam, a couple of beams on this bike rack here, and I hung it up. And the kids automatically flocked to it, it's like magnetically, um, and immediately wanted to play with it. And because the kids were playing with me and the parents saw me playing with the kids, 
then the parents could trust me too. So it was a whole process of just doing this. And I actually didn't mean for it to be a social practice. I just did it because I wanted to be upside down and I knew the kids would like it too. Um, but I do feel that playfulness is very much a part of getting to know any community, but also a part of understanding the technology that you're working with in order for you to progress. So I very much believe in playfulness just in life. Um, an interesting thing happened within the dynamics of working with Ariel as social practice is that the kids are from everywhere, but they had they started to sort of self-organize because they wanted each a few turns on the Ariel hammock. So you have like these little boys are from Somalia and those girls are from Chechnya, you know, but they all sort of were organizing themselves, telling each other to get in line, to take off their shoes, this is how you do it, you know, and in my very broken German, I would give them instructions on how to hang their feet around and things like that. And then they would repeat my instructions in their better German. <laughs> so I was learning from them and they were learning from me. Okay. Um, so people have often asked me why I always work in immersive space. I have a tendency to work in 3D space and like to do mixed reality things. And I've been doing mixed reality for since like 2000. Five, um, but now it's a thing, right? Now it's like mixed reality, augmented reality. So, um, but I feel like sometimes we have to answer the question, why? Why is being in immersive space so important? And I think that there's a really good reason for it. And there's a reason why our desktops look like this. And it's because we really want this, right? We want to be surrounded by that. And when you think about it, our brain actually thrives in 3D. Like we live in 3D. Like this space is 3D. Like we don't live in two-dimensional space. We, we perceive things in two-dimensional space because that's where our screens are. We have phones, we have laptops, we have tablets, things like that. So we have to perceive things in 2D space, but our brain actually wants to perceive it in 3D space. So when you think about it, people create memory palaces, right? You've heard of memory palaces, which is like sort of a memory technique to remember things where you place lists inside rooms inside a house. So if I ask you right now, what's in your kitchen, right? Think about what's in your kitchen. And you're probably envisioning your kitchen as a 3D space. You're walking to your cabinets, opening the cabinets. Here are the plates. Over here is the refrigerator. Inside the refrigerator looks like this. You're probably perceiving it like that. Right? You're not probably perceiving your kitchen as a two-dimensional flat picture or as a list. Right? So we want to perceive things, and our brain thrives in 3D space. So I really think that this is where it's all going to go, and you're, we're already seeing it. We're seeing a lot of um, work on sort of consumer-grade VR things and like what we can do in VR space. So I think immersive is definitely um, a stickier kind of communication interaction. So the way that it played out once we figured out what we wanted to do, which took a little while too, um, was that I, once I got to know the kids, I started taking also German classes with the adults. And the German classes are actually compulsory um, as part of their asylum seeking. So I would just sit with them in class, and I found myself really gravitating more towards this women's group that would meet in the mornings for three hours every day and taking German next to them and getting to, them, getting to know them that way. And then it came about that uh, they really wanted whatever workshop I was going to do to fit into their German class because they were taking German three or four hours a day. So they were like, we don't want to take another workshop after that. Whatever you do has to involve us learning German and be inside the parameters of the class. So I decided, like, OK, maybe what we can do can serve both purposes. So I decided we could blend uh, storytelling with sort of uh, 360 degree photos. So then it came about that um, I would teach them to take 360 degree photos and then stitch the audio into it. And the audio would be them practicing their German, telling me about a little bit about their lives, like where, they're com where they come from, what their family is like. They would write the sentences, read them, I recorded them, and then I stitched them into 360 degree photos. And then I also taught them how to work with Google Cardboards, which I'll put this one together for you. Um, and then taught them how to take 360 degree photos themselves. So it was really about sort of giving them a level of digital literacy that they could then do on their own and doing it with as low-fi resources as possible. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so this is them putting the Google Cardboards together, which was like a really fun thing to do. And then after the workshop, they could all keep them 
right? So it was a, like a little puzzle gift that ended up working out really well. So this is, um, um, oh, so those, the women that you just saw here, they're from uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. And this one is from Chechnya. I've blurred out their eyes a little bit, so it looks maybe a little bit weird, but they just didn't want to have like, uh, they wanted a little bit of anonymity. But what I loved about the women's class is that um, you had, some of them brought their babies in, so you would have like mothers balancing babies in one arm and doing the class and then doing the Google Cardboard in the other arm. Like they really like were serious multitaskers, much so than like the mixed classes were. So I really um, developed a special place in my heart for uh, the women's class here. Okay, and this is with the uh, Google Cardboards all put together, so it was a fun time. So the toolkit, um, and I'm calling it a toolkit because I think it's very scalable and I think that you can do this really anywhere, is any, in, in any displaced community, in a school, is to, to make sure that, again, it's scalable and it's uh, portable and it's really lo-fi. So really all you need is the Google Cardboard itself, which you can get for three or four euro on eBay. Uh, and I just buy them in bulk. And the Google Street View app and an internet connection, a web cube, and the, where I stitch the audio stories together in the photosphere, storyspheres.com, which is sort of a DIY web VR site. Okay, and the whole reason for keeping it this uh, small and portable is so that they could do it themselves, but also you can sort of port it to anywhere, right? So again, really all you need are these three things and then a Google Cardboard. Okay, so I'll just, show a little bit more about the StorySphere interface. It's a third party site, it connects with Google. Um, so I use the Google Street View app, so it works really well together. Um, I really think web VR, you're gonna see a lot more web VR in the next year. Very similar sites to this probably popping up within the next few months. One of my friends is working on one. Um, so, but basically you can upload the photo sphere that you take from Google Street View into Story Spheres, and then it lets you have an interface where you can also upload MP3s. Right. So once you've uploaded the MP3s, it takes you to an editing interface where you can then scroll around where you want that audio clip to be placed. And then over here on the right, you can see that it gives you the X and the Y angles. You can move it up or down, the distance from or to the object upon which you're mapping it, and the volume. And it does that for every audio clip. And then once you save it, you're taken to a publishing screen. And I think um, I have another one here. So this is actually Maria, and I'll show you in a minute um, that story sphere. <clears throat> so this is the publishing screen where you can add tags, the titles, um, put it onto like the public gallery, that kind of a thing. So I just wanted to show a bit of that because I, I seem to get a, always a lot of questions around that. Um, but here is where I would say, okay, now it's your turn. I'm gonna go ahead and put this together, but I'll ask that you go ahead and go to that URL, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash Thrive Macondo. Okay, and that will actually take you to a page on my site that looks like this. Okay, again, the URL is at the top there. Um, and on this site, you'll be able to, I think it works best in Chrome, um, but I haven't tried it in Safari. I've only tried it in Chrome. But basically, once you click on that, I'll show you what it looks like. It'll open the photosphere that you click on, that you tap on, and it will open by default to the screen where you can just tap to begin and you'll be able to see like that. But if you, and I'm gonna pass around these Google Cardboards. If you tap on this little icon here, the little, it looks like a mask, looks like a Google Cardboard, it will turn it into a split screen, right? So for those of you that have worked with VR before, it'll turn it into a split screen so you'll see two images, but when you wear the Google Cardboard and you look at it through this, your eyes perceive it as one 360 degree photo, right? So again, you want to tap on that little Google Cardboard icon and it'll turn into a split screen. So I'll show you here what it looks like when you put it inside one of these, for those who haven't done this. Okay, so this is your normal Google Cardboard. Um, this rubber band actually keeps the phone in place, right? 
So I'm going to just take this. I'm going to take this off for a second. And you're going to place it right here in this little tray and then put the rubber band around it. That keeps it from sliding out and falling on the floor. <laughs> OK. All right. So it looks like that. And now I'm going to go to that URL that I just told you to go to. right? And I already have it open to one of the photospheres, which is the one that's labeled Maria in her garden. And I'm going to put this back on. OK. So you'll see now that it's two images, right? And then it says tap to begin. So I'll tap to begin it. And I'm going to close it up here. It's a little bit unwieldy with all the cords coming out of it. OK. OK. So now I can just look around. And you'll see that there are little musical notes in the image. And where there's a musical note, I can just look at it, right? And if I look at it, it the circle will zoom in, and you'll start to hear the audio. I thought I, I'm not going to live here and, and uh, raise a family in this uh, fashion. So as you move around, and note that I can't just scroll. Like I actually have to like move around. It's like spatially mapped. Um, and here you have the rest of her garden. There's an, there's an audio clip there. Um, I think I have an audio clip here where her herbs are. Yeah, there's one here. Right? So, <laughs> so I'm going to go out of here and go back to this one. So this one is that, that was Maria in her garden. And basically, she's one of the older refugees there. She's been there about 30 years. She uh, migrated when um, Slovakia uh, was still communist. So basically, this is the one, this is a photosphere. Oh, and, and to finish my sentence about what I was saying about her garden, she basically uh, built in a garden, and then other settlers built gardens, and then they created this beautiful like space of like 20, 30 gardens where there was nothing but dirt. So, and she built everything in that space that you just saw, like a little house, a stone path, you know, so they kind of, are, have been really resourceful in sort of building something beautiful out of nothing. Um, so this one, and I'll keep this one as one image so you can see it a little bit better. <clears throat> and this is the classroom where they learned their German in. So over here are the women from Somalia. And then over here are the women from Chechnya. And then here are women from Kabul, Afghanistan. And then over on the left side here, um, are w the women from Syria. So I'm going to come over here back to the Somalian women. And again, you just can look at it, and it zooms into the audio, and it should start playing. <laughs> So I'll go ahead and pass this, these two around. And again, you can just put your phones in it and go to that URL. And I'll put the URL back up so you can see it. All right, there you go. There. OK. All right. So why don't we just start from like sort of different ends of the room? Oh, OK. Thank you. And then I'll also show you just how to put it together for those that aren't familiar with it. So basically, it comes like this, or it might come like, like that, right? Um, I like the ones that have the numbers on them because it tells you what slot goes in where, um, which I know sounds simple. But when you're putting a lot of these together and asking people who are maybe speaking a different language to put it together, it's really easy to just tell them to follow the numbers. Um, and just some of them are made better than others, and I happen to like these ones. 
So if anyone wants the link on eBay, I can give it to you. But basically, if you just follow the numbers, like I found that going out of order is really troublesome. Um, so one goes to one, right? So one would go to, where is it, here. And this is the nose bridge. That makes the nose bridge. Yeah. And then you kind of turn it around like this. And then you'll see that the rest of it pretty much falls right in line like that. You'll see that the nose bridge then goes there, five goes to five. Yeah, and then these are two and three. And it kind of, you can, after you get just this one piece folded over, the rest of it really makes sense. And then you can just find the rest of the slots like that. And there's like little tape here. Some of them just come with um, Velcro and tape. And then you can just press that on. And voila, you have your Google Cardboard, OK? Uh, the rubber band might be in a different place. So the rubber band, you'll want to move it and put it onto where like the phone piece of it goes. And you really do need that, or else it'll slide, your phone will slide right out. I like the bigger ones, so it holds like the bigger phones. Um, like mine is a little bit bigger. Um, but it also holds the smaller phones. So just, yeah. So I can now pass this one around. And I'll just walk to the middle, OK? OK. So again, the URL is just bit.ly slash Thrive And you can go ahead and go to one of the photo spheres. And again, when you see a musical note, just kind of hover over it. Like it might take like a second or two for it to, you'll see the circle zoom into it. And then the audio will, will trigger. OK. So um, I want to, at this point, get to know you guys and see what your questions are and any thoughts or feedback that you might have. And is everything coming up OK with the cardboards that are being passed around? Yes, OK. All right, so um, of the two, oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, one of my immediate questions was, obviously, this is very low tech, um, the, the um, materials that you're using, yeah. um, except for the smartphones. Have you encountered any troubles um, using this as kind of an integration process with refugees that might not have um, that technology available? or does Part of your program provide that um, for them to use? Um, I found that the first thing that they get is a smartphone, um, like just pretty much as a default thing, because that might be their only internet connection. And the first thing they get is a data plan where they can uh, WhatsApp or you know um, kick you know communicate, but basically SMS their relatives. Right, So pretty much everyone has a smartphone. And I found that that's why I ended up going this particular route. Um, but I did bring in my own web cube because they don't want it. Of course, I wouldn't want them to use their data to do this. It's pretty like high data intensive. It's like high processor intensive uh, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question because certainly there are refugee camps versus settlements. Like Macondo is very much a settlement. You know, they already are in the process of seeking their asylum. So there are some assumptions around that they do already have like a roof over their head, you know, and things. And they have German classes. So they are being provided, you know, pretty good resources. But I find that in any of those communities and from what I've talked to about other people who have gone through camps is that really like the smartphone is the first thing they get. Yeah. Sure. They get recorded and everyone yeah. can hear them. Uh, did you ask these women about their experience and what they learned from the workshop that you did with them? Did they reflect on the benefits of it? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the question was, did I ask the women in the workshop um, what they thought of it? Did they reflect on it? And what were their thoughts on it? So <clears throat> I actually came up with a workshop with them um, because, and this is, I think, a funny story. Um, I came in with an idea that I would do workshops that might be like movement oriented, like movement or healing workshops. And then I met them and I was like, oh, that's not what they need at all. <laughs> that's like not what they want at all. So I got to know them through the German classes that I took with them. So we actually came up with it together. And that's when they said, you know, we want to do something that helps us learn 
German and also something that'd be like kind of fun and you know if you're into digital media something fun and they really didn't know right they were just like it needs to be like fascinating and we can still learn our German and I thought like okay what about this and I brought in my own cardboard and I showed them a 360 degree photo of like an underwater you know scuba environment and they were like wow cool you know so I was like okay I can teach you how to make this kind of photo and you can tell your stories in German you know so that was something that we actually came up with together um, and you know then working inside that space I don't know that they uh, that they really knew what they what they were getting into but I think it's very experiential like once you put on the goggles and you're in the space and you're standing under the same Sun you know as whatever you're looking at um, you know, VR is said to be an empathy building machine, and I feel like that's, I hear that a lot now, but I still think it's very true. Um, so I think they really appreciated it. Um, some of them um, thought of it as more of a toy that they would give their kids, which is fine too. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> we're going way back in history. Okay, so what, um, at, like, what did I experience as a woman in tech in the early 2000s? Is that it? And what sorts of attitudes have changed now? Um, so in the early 2000s, um, I think that there was a similar sort of predominance, as there still is now, of being like, a few there in conferences, in spaces, in performances, and um, other sorts of workshops, of there being just a few women and a lot more men. So it's always been like a little bit more of a sausage fest, um, so to speak. Um, that I don't. I honestly don't think that has changed that much. I mean, I think there's more of a movement to make it more diverse, and certainly like more initiatives within companies, especially like large companies and Fortune 500 companies, to be diverse. Um, but I definitely don't think we're there yet, although I appreciate that the movement is going in that direction. Um, I was fortunate that in the places where I worked, especially within uh, the artists in residence and the other sorts of uh, programs that I initiated that I showed in Kids Connect and in Amsterdam and, um, and even in the tech camps, that it, uh, it's very much a women nurturing sort of environment. So um, even though it might, there might be sort of a male dominance about it, that it's very uh, feminist friendly. So um, I don't know that I ex experienced any particular attitudes that would be, and especially now with a new administration in the US, maybe <laughs> there might be a little bit of a step back. Um, I, I hope that it still keeps moving forward. Um, there certainly have been changes in the new administration that make me feel like we're gonna jump back about 50 years. Uh, but I think that's even more of a reason to move things forward. <laughs> so, yeah. And I think one of our final questions was, was the first photo real holding a man on your shoulder? <laughs> was the first photo <laughs> real? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That was actually, let me go to, <laughs> where was that? It was here, I think. Oh yeah, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was me in, I don't remember, I think like 1998 or something like that. It was a really long time ago. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was my dance partner at the time, Wesley. And I really like lifting. Um, and maybe that's my own sort of my own, the way that my own feminism manifests is that even though like I'm fairly petite, like I love to lift people, like I, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, I still do contact improv dance, like in New York, some, there's like a contact improv dance jam that happens every Saturday for a few hours, and you can just pop in and out of it and improvise as you like. And we all lift each other, so it's very, I feel like, equalizing and democratizing because we do have the strength to lift other people, it's just about the mechanics of how you lift. And I think that's actually very much translatable into 
real life in, in, in any discipline. It's just like you have to just understand the mechanics of how the lift works, right? So I'm not going to try to muscle him up. I'm going to try to get him like through here and here, like the shoulder and the pelvis. And I might like go under him with like the strong part of my body, which is my shoulders and my upper back, right? So like that's how I'm going to hang, like that's how I'm going to lift him. And that's how I would hold somebody up. And that's how I would take them up further, right? So it's just about the mechanics and understanding your body space um, and understanding how that works. And so I get a lot of joy from uh, doing lifts and to be able to being able to do that, and I still do. Um, and I think that's also why I like doing aerial Pilates is because like for me, I'm lif lifting myself up and I'm able to sort of build up like upper body strength and um, help other people to build that up. And um, yeah, there's something really liberating about lifting a man. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Well, thank you so much for your attention and time. And a uh, big thanks and hat tip to the organizers of the Women Tech Makers Conference. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you.